What gives Bitcoin its value? In this episode, GPT-4 and I are going to be answering this question. No, we are not experts, so make sure to take what we say with a grain of salt. Okay, so I begin by asking GPT-4, quote, what gives Bitcoin its value? And GPT responds by giving me a list of 10 reasons why Bitcoin has value. Now, before I go ahead and start by reading the number one item in this list, I want to just share my thoughts on what I thought the answer was to this question. So my understanding about a currency or a cryptocurrency in terms of what gives it its value is essentially the idea that it's able to be spent in a different context. So for example, if I get a haircut and I pay 10 euros for my haircut, my hairdresser understands the fact that he is able to take that 10 euros and spend it, let's say at the grocery store, or hold on to that 10 euros and then spend it on something else later. And so now let's compare my response or my idea to how GPT responded to this question. So GPT's number one reason is, quote, supply and demand. Like any other asset, Bitcoin's value is primarily determined by the market dynamics of supply and demand. The supply of Bitcoin is limited to 21 million coins, and this scarcity often plays a significant role in its evaluation. Okay, so some thoughts on this. Firstly, this makes sense to me, right? It's factually true that supply and demand plays a role in Bitcoin's price, in Bitcoin's value. There are, in fact, 21 million coins. But I do want to mention that scarcity in itself, right, the fact that there's only 21 million coins does not actually give Bitcoin value alone because there's many things in this world that are scarce or finite that don't have the same value as Bitcoin. So obviously, there's something else that contributes to Bitcoin's value. I also want to mention that Bitcoin is expected to become more valuable over time because it's expected that the number of Bitcoin over time will be reduced. And this makes sense because once Bitcoin, for example, reaches 21 million, then in theory, what that means is Bitcoins will eventually get lost. People will lose access to their bank accounts and so on. And so it's expected to be more valuable as time goes on. Now, there's a point here that has to do with deflation. Okay, the idea of deflation is that by having a currency become more valuable over time, it'll discourage spending. And that's a concept in economics. Now, there's been an argument against this, which is the idea that if Bitcoin, for example, has a supply that is essentially fixed, meaning it can't be controlled by anyone, and you can anticipate that increase in supply over time, then it's not by definition the same idea of deflation as economists describe it to be. And that's contrast, for example, to a fiat currency or a normal currency, where the rate of money coming into circulation is decided by individuals. Okay, this is different from Bitcoin because, again, the amount of Bitcoin that's put into circulation is de decided and built into the software. This 21 million tokens, essentially, this number. And the rate in which Bitcoin comes into circulation, again, is decided by the software. It's not decided by a centralized control, like a government, for example. And so, therefore, it has been argued that Bitcoin is not, by definition, by economist standard, a deflationary asset, or at least a deflationary asset in the negative sense. Reason number two, quote, decentralization. Unlike traditional currencies, Bitcoin operates on a decentralized network using blockchain technology. This means no single entity controls Bitcoin, making it attractive to those who prefer a system where their money isn't controlled by a central authority. So this is probably one of the most important points to be made about Bitcoin, the fact that it's decentralized. What does decentralized mean? Decentralized means that essentially nobody controls it. How that works in actual practice is that there are people running computers across the world verifying information that occurs on the blockchain, such as transactions. It's all financial information. If I send you $10, for example, people are going to ensure that I actually have $10 to send to you. And then that transaction occurs and that there's no essentially meddling with that transaction. And that's different from a centralized bank in that the bank has the ability to reverse transactions. It has the ability to freeze your account. And that's not true in the context of decentralized money system, peer-to-peer -peer cash system like Bitcoin, because it's decentralized. And that also essentially means that you're actually in control of your funds. You're able to do what you want with your money without having to trust a system. The idea that Bitcoin is trustless means that you don't need to give trust in the system in order to use the system. When you give money to a bank, right, you're trusting in that bank to not, for example, go under. You're trusting it for not to lose your funds. You're trusting that it, for example, has proper security measures to ensure it is safe from any attacks. And that's not true when it comes to decentralized systems such as Bitcoin. Continuing on, third point, quote, adoption and acceptance. The increasing acceptance of Bitcoin by consumers, businesses, and investors contributes to its value. As more people use and invest in Bitcoin, its value naturally rises due to increased demand. Some thoughts on this. Firstly, this is actually probably one of the main criticisms of Bitcoin is the fact that it's actually not really used in society as a medium of exchange. Warren Buffett, a notorious investor, for example, says, quote, it's not a durable means of exchange. And here he's referring to Bitcoin. So it's an interesting question. 
if adoption will take place due to the fact that the speed in which transactions occur on the Bitcoin network are very slow. That would be, for example, slow compared to a credit card. I also want to mention the fact that Bitcoin is internet money. It's a piece of software, and all you need to do in order to interact with that software is essentially have an internet connection and, say, you know, a computer or a phone. And this is very different from, for example, opening a bank account. It's much easier to have access to the blockchain. So as technology increases, as people have more access to cell phones, there could be an argument which says that as people want to hold value in a currency that is not, for example, their national currency due to reasons such as loss of purchasing power, then they might choose to hold Bitcoin on their phones as opposed to, for example, through their banks in their bank accounts. Or if you are not able to actually have a bank account for whatever reason, you can simply hold your wealth in Bitcoin on your phone. Furthermore, I think there's a point that should be made about uh, distrust in governments. We've seen recently in the US and Canada, a decrease in the amount of trust in governments to make good decisions on our behalf. According to a Pew Research study in a report titled, quote, public trust in government, it states, fewer than two in 10 Americans say they trust in the government in Washington to do what is right, end quote. So, what this suggests is that a decentralized way to allow people to exchange money with each other is probably in demand. Now, whether or not that's going to be adopted or not, we, can, we don't know. I mean, at this point, I would argue that Bitcoin has not been adopted mainstream. Typically, you can't walk into a coffee shop and look at Bitcoin. So the criticism from Warren Buffett here that it's not a durable mean of exchange as it stands is true, at least today. Now, whether that's true 10 years from now, there's an argument to be made on both sides. Let's continue reading the next item. Number four, quote, utility. Bitcoin provides a digital, global, and in some cases, more efficient way to transfer value across the internet. Its utility in enabling cross-border transactions without the need for a traditional banking infrastructure adds to its value. Okay, so personally, personally, I recently had to send money from my Canadian bank account to my Portuguese bank account. That was done through banks. That took two days, if not three days. And it was a system, you know, it was a system that was not transparent. Essentially, I did not know what was happening behind the scenes. If I compare that to sending money between my bank accounts on Polygon, which is a blockchain, I can see very clearly the address that I send it from, where it's being received to, when it was verified, how much gas I had to pay, which is like a fee I had to pay. And it was all done in a transparent way. That has to do with the nature of the transparency of the blockchain. By simply searching up your account ID, you're able to verify the information of that transaction. The same is not true when using a centralized bank. You cannot simply see what's happening behind the scenes when you're doing an international wire transfer. And furthermore, the speed in which the transactions occur on the blockchain are much faster. To do a transaction, and for example, on the Bitcoin network, doesn't take more than 30 minutes. It takes much less, actually. Compare that to two days, you can see an argument to be made how it's much faster. Furthermore, as I mentioned, it's easy to verify because you can simply look at the transaction through what's, let's say, a block explorer. Block explorer, by the way, is simply a website you can look at that says the history of transactions. Because remember, all the blockchain is, is a record of transactions where people are verifying those transactions to be true, to be accurate. Those are the nodes. And so this is a system that's trustless and actually solves a problem in the real world. Interestingly, this is not listed as a reason here, but I would argue that one of the most important points about Bitcoin is the fact that it solves a problem in the real world. It solves the Byzantine gener generals problem in distributed computing through its proof of work consensus mechanism. And also, furthermore, I would describe it as being simply an innovation in distributed computing and actually also solves the problem of double spend in digital currencies. So there's an actual, I'll, and by the way, I'll jump into these two points in a different episode. But the idea here is that Bitcoin actually solves a problem in the real world. Okay, it's decentralized and, and more importantly, cannot be stopped. What I mean by that is if, for example, a country decides to ban Bitcoin or several countries decide to ban Bitcoin, that actually doesn't affect the network because it is a decentralized network across the world. There are machines or computers running across the world that are responsible for verifying the information on the blockchain. And so because this is decentralized and it is essentially cannot be tampered with, there can be no influence from governments, there can be no influence from, from, um, from countries. It's an interesting piece of technology. Number five, quote, speculation. A significant portion of Bitcoin's value comes from speculative interest. Investors buy it with the expectation that it will increase in value over time, not necessarily for its utility as a currency. Going back to what Warren Buffett said. Okay, so a couple of thoughts on this. Firstly, crypto has historically attracted degenerate gamblers. It has attracted people who are trying to get rich quick. It has attracted criminals to, put, to, to, to essentially 
conduct pump and dump schemes. Okay, if you have heard about blockchain, you have probably, if I were to assume, you have probably heard about some form of scam. Now, it is true that blockchain, has, as an industry, has lots of scams. But again, that does not, for example, mean that it doesn't have value and it is not an innovation in computer science. Both can be true at the same time. And it is true that speculation obviously plays a significant role in the fluctuation in price of a currency. According to Domenis et al. 2021, Bitcoin is acting more as a speculative asset rather than a steady store of value. This can be drawn from the comparison with a debt market, i.e. a treasury bond that invests in long dated 30 years US treasuries with which Bitcoin shows no relationship. Okay, so this is from a scientific paper I wanted to quote. So at this point, at this point, it's evident that Bitcoin is being treated more as a speculative asset as opposed to a store of value. Now, that does not necessarily mean that will be what it looks like 10 years from now. And furthermore, I think that one of the things we're seeing today is that the amount of volatility that exists within Bitcoin is tremendously less than it was, say, in 2013, 2014. So in other words, the response to things like, let's say, the new cycle responds in less of fluctuation in the price. Okay, and this actually makes sense because there's been a broader range of Bitcoin adoption, meaning people across the board are holding Bitcoin more, which means it's more challenging to cause fluctuations in the price of Bitcoin. Now, this is actually an argument in favor of why Bitcoin will not be a volatile asset in the future. The argument is essentially that as more people continuously hold Bitcoin and it becomes adopted into the mainstream, the volatility will decrease as it will require more, essentially more funds in order to change the price. Reason number six, perceived value. Like gold, Bitcoin is often viewed as a store of value, especially in times of economic uncertainty. Its, per its perceived value as a digital gold or as a hedge against inflation can influence its price, end quote. Okay, so let's, let's review that. There are similarities between gold and between Bitcoin. What are those similarities? Okay, firstly, they're both scarce. They're both scarce because, firstly, in order for new Bitcoin to be put into circulation, okay, the proof of work consensus mechanism has to work. And I'm not going to jump into that, but essentially it's responsible for keeping Bitcoin scarce. Okay, it's also built into the software to keep Bitcoin scarce. And similarly, gold, gold can only be mined a certain amount every year. It's, it's essentially an environmental restriction on its increased supply. And gold actually has been has kept its value for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Gold is not tied to a currency. It's not tied to the control you know, of the government. The government does, does not decide, essentially, how much gold comes into circulation. And so there could be an argument that both gold and Bitcoin can be viewed as a decentralized currency or store of value because it's not under the control of a government and it has it is restricted in its ability to become into circulation. Number seven, quote, media and public perception. The way Bitcoin is portrayed in the media and the public perception of its potential and risks can influence its value. Positive news can lead to price increases while negative news can lead to decreases. So we mentioned this point previously when we were discussing essentially speculation and Media and public perception obviously plays a significant role in what gives Bitcoin its price. So in conclusion, there are seven reasons, or in this case, 10 reasons, but I've chosen the first seven in what gives Bitcoin its value. Thank you for listening.